I've done a bunch of videos where we're talking about the genetics of fish and coral. The warming oceans and the resulting destruction of coral reefs have triggered all sorts of research into the ability of corals to turn on or upregulate genes that help protect against the effects of heat. But I'm not a geneticist, and I've had to look up a lot of bunch of stuff to make those videos. So I thought it was time to share some of that knowledge, particularly in light of a really neat paper that I came across that was published in January of 2021. Hi guys and girls, I'm Rick Mann, and this time it is time to learn about gene expression plasticity. The paper containing all of this info, and a lot more, is titled A Framework for Understanding Gene Expression Plasticity and Its Influence on Stress Tolerance. And it's open access, so I'd highly recommend checking it out if you're interested in this sort of stuff. The authors have done a great job, really a, an excellent job, explaining the concepts with examples, making it a lot more approachable than most of the genetics papers that I've read. So what is gene expression anyway? Well, simply put, it's just the production of chemicals and things like that, which the genes that make up your genome code for. You may have some that code for pigment in your eyes, and so you could have brown eyes. That is the expression of a gene, and corals, fish, and basically every other living thing has the same sort of thing going on. It's important to consider the impact of gene expression in research, because imagine if your experiment only contained brown-eyed individuals. You might miss the fact that eye color is a result of genetics. So then, what is gene expression plasticity? Aren't things just born with genes that are set and static? Well, if you have brown eyes today, you'll always have them, right? It turns out, no. Different environmental stressors can turn on and off genes. Now, in the case of your eyes color, that is set for life. But there are a lot of genes that are only activated when the proper trigger is given. And some of those genes can deactivate when that trigger goes away. That is plasticity. Daphnia, a common food for captive bred fish, and even some corals, they have a gene that responds to chemical cues from fish in the water. They grow a spiked helmet as protection, and they even pass this on to their offspring. If the offspring grow up in an area without fish, though, then their offspring, the third generation, won't have the spiked helmet anymore. Gene expression plasticity can also impart heat tolerance to coral. And it can even change the behavior of some plants and animals. One theory as to why this happens is that it gives the species a chance for its genome to catch up to some environmental stress. By being able to survive a heat wave, over time, the animals that are exposed over and over again to the, that heat are going to just develop genes that are better suited to survival. Of course, it's also very possible that none of this happens. The stressor is just too great and the animal dies. One way researchers find gene plasticity is by studying ancestral populations if we know about them. Now, if we know that a given group of animals ancestrally came from a different region, we can learn about their genetics by comparing the two populations living under different conditions. Sticklebacks, they're a fish related to seahorses and pipefish, and they're found in both marine and freshwater, is one example of how this could work you can compare the ancestral population, the marine population, to the freshwater population of the same species and look at the differences in gene expression in those two environments. In fact, that's fundamental to how we can study gene expression. By its very nature, it requires looking at the same animal or plant or whatever under different conditions. Otherwise, you can't tell what genes get turned on and off under those conditions. We've done a lot of these studies in Acropora and other corals specifically in response to ocean warming. That's how we know that Acropora can turn on genes to give it a little bit of protection against the damaging proteins that form under warmer water temperatures. Since you need a gene to produce the heat shock proteins that are giving you that protection, and since more of those proteins generally means more protection, it's a great thing if you can upregulate that gene and make more copies of it. 
some animals upregulate genes like this just as a general rule. But this can have a detrimental impact if those heat shock proteins aren't needed. This is called front loading. The gene that produces the protein is front loaded before it's actually needed. The, just the baseline expression of it is higher and that expression doesn't really change much. It's not a plastic gene. This is great if the fish or the plant or coral or whatever is living in a really variable environment where they're often exposed to stress. Maybe near a shoreline where the temperature is just really variable because the water is shallow. The other version of this is a gene that really protects a coral from stress, but that's also super expensive to maintain in its upregulated state. It can't be front loaded. It just needs too many chemicals, raw materials that could otherwise be used for growth and reproduction. Instead of front loading the gene, sometimes the expression of these genes is very plastic. They can upregulate it quickly when they need to and then downregulate it when the stress event is over. Now, obviously, doing it this way does delay the response to the stress a bit, though, so it is a trade off. The ability to do this seems to be easily passed on to subsequent generations. We've seen that generational pass on in everything from yeast to fruit flies to corals, turtles, and even humans. And that's a great thing because it allows a population to pass on protections that they've developed to stresses that subsequent generations are likely to face. It can also depend on the phase of life that an animal is in when you look at its gene expression in a research study. Fish and coral all go through a larval phase when the expression of their genes is changing almost hourly. Now, even in adult animals, gene expression can change in just a matter of hours in some cases. Developmental plasticity, which is a change in gene expression during a developmental stage of life, is often a much more permanent thing. It changes and then doesn't change back. They don't return to a baseline level. The Daphnia that I mentioned earlier are an example of this. They get those spiky helmets early in life and they don't ever lose them, even passing them on to the next generation of their offspring. I thought that this was just a really cool paper and I hope that you take the time to look at it. I hope you enjoyed the video. The link is down below as always. So if you want just way more examples, a lot more information on this, check it out. It's open access as I mentioned. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe to my channel. I usually post once a week or so. I know I've been a little bit lax lately. I was out of town, but have a fantastic day. See you next time. Bye.